Monkey is swallowing. Snake says swallowing. Next, a swallow too will fly and come and swallow. You ever swallow in a hollow galo, making a whole lot of halabalu. Jale galu, we know say you drop the money from, so give me the loot. Do you really want a revolution or just your turn? Hello and welcome to Ake Arts and Book Festival 2020 online. My name is Molara Wood and I have the pleasure of moderating this panel on publishing while African. With the panelists, Luis Umutoni, publisher of Huza Press in Uganda, Tabiso Malape, founder of Blackbird Books in South Africa, and Elias Wondimu uh, of Sehai Publishing, uh, operating from the US. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. So we'll just uh, go straight into the introductory talk. And I think we'll start with Louise Umutoni uh, to tell us about her experience with Huza Press in Uganda and the terrain over there. And then when she's done, we'll go to Elias Wandimu and then to Malape. So over to you, Louise. Thank you very much, Malara. And thank you so much for having me. Um, I feel quite privileged um, to be part of this discussion. I suppose I'll just start with maybe just a slight um, correction around uh, where we operate. So Huza Press is actually based in Rwanda, so not, uh, not Uganda, but very much our neighbours, so that should be fine. Um, so maybe just a little bit about publishing um, in Rwanda and what that's actually meant for us. So Huza Press has been going for about five years now. And um, from the very beginning, we were quite um, driven um, to uh, produce works by Rwandans, by Africans, um, you know, with the primary focus, of course, on East Africa first, and then sort of looking much broadly across the continent. And the idea was to provide that platform for African stories. Now, in the case of Rwanda, this was actually very important. Um, Rwanda, uh, is a country whereby we, we've we not had a lot of um, works coming out of Rwanda by Rwandans. Um, and so there was um, quite um, a lack of, um, of uh, work by Rwandan authors. A lot of our stories had been told by others. Um, so we wanted to redress that that gap. We wanted to actually say that, you know, Rwandans do know what their story is and they actually want to be able to share their various experiences um, with the rest of the world. And so we wanted to provide a space for that to happen. Um, now, of course, starting a publishing business in Rwanda, whereby um, you've not had a lot of writers producing work before, was um, a difficult decision. And we could actually, and we you know, immediately encountered quite a lot of, of challenges. Some of them, of course, will be um, relatable across the continent, but I think um, some were quite particular to Rwanda. So, you know, one big one was, of course, around, um, you know, Rwandan, the Rwandan reading culture. Um, having not had a lot of um, work produced from the content from Rwanda, of course, was not, uh, you know, unusual. It was largely because a lot of Rwandans were not, uh, you know, reading or writing. And so essentially we didn't have a lot of works coming out. And so coming in and saying, you know, we're going to actually create a business uh, around this was, uh, according to very many people, a crazy idea. But we thought, you know what, um, you know, we'll take the plunge and, uh, and see what happens. And like many other parts of the continent, um, you know, that it was our industry in Rwanda was, was largely dominated by the school book market. And so anyone who actually opened any sort of publishing business was selling to schools and that was about it. And they were working with government and that was about it. And here we were proposing to actually do something that was not necessarily driven by um, the school book market, but rather, um, you know, by the stories that we wanted to showcase and tell um, and, um, and sort of get to different audiences. So that was a very sort of we were going against the grain there, and that's and that was very difficult. And we've encountered quite a lot of challenges. Uh, you know, we've had to try and build that particular part of the industry from scratch. Um, so whether it entails 
building the expertise um, that would be able to service uh, the work that we wanted. Say, for example, editors, um, you know, whether it's proofreaders, whether it's, uh, you know, writers themselves having to do a lot of training um, to be able to produce those uh, people that would be able to service that industry. And, you know, five years on, we can see some of the results of that. Still a lot to do, still a lot that, um, that we're doing. But I would say that, um, you know, those are some of the challenges that um, a lot of publishers, I think, would probably have come against when trying to start um, an industry like this on the continent. I'm sure that um, my colleagues will probably also share a few of those. But I mean, one other big one that's been um, discussed across the continent is the issue of language, right? So, you know, Rwanda has just one language that's, um, that, you know, that we all use. But then, of course, we've also been, uh, you know, we were colonized by a certain group of people. Uh, the French uh, brought, I mean, sorry, the Belgians brought in French. And then, of course, uh, Rwanda chose to pursue a journey where we um, adopted English. And then, of course, that also brought a lot of complexity in terms of, you know, what language of communication are we going to use? What language are people writing stories in? And of course that impacted as well the sort of stories that people were telling because of course they were trying to use these languages that were quite unfamiliar um, to, to many of them. So th there's you know, th those complexities as well. And then I'll probably just say one last one that cuts across I think for all of us, um, which is around um, distribution. So I imagine that my colleagues will probably um, be able to uh, relate to the fact that we still struggle as African publishers to actually get our works uh, across the continent. I mean, let alone even just across the border. Huh? Um, the cost of getting a book from Rwanda to Nairobi, from Kigali to Nairobi is probably, you know, twice as much as the cost of that book. So it's impossible for us to actually be able to try and get our works across. So that's proven, you know, quite difficult um, for many of us. And maybe just one tiny one, which, which I want to add, is around capital. Not a lot of people are looking to invest in, in, in the publishing industry, unfortunately. Um, so we, we, you know, we're sort of building from scratch, but then, you know, coming against all of this and still not having the same amount of support that, say, people in the tech industry would have or other industries, you know, we're really coming against, I think, quite a lot of, um, of different things. And it makes it very difficult to operate in the space. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Louis. And uh, yes, of course, you're operating from Rwanda. I uh, know that as well as anyone. And uh, maybe one of the things that we could even address later is this whole lumping uh, that can happen of a whole region, and which I just um, uh, committed <laughs> that offense <laughs> uh, just, just now. Yes, so operating from Rwanda and doing a great uh, job there. Thank you very much. We'll just go to Elias uh, Wondimu. Uh, say hi, publishers. Yes, please talk uh, about what you do. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much for having me uh, at Ake Festival. I have been following Ake Festival from a distance for a very long time. Uh, and uh, I've met many of uh, your writers uh, when I visited uh, uh, the book fair a few few years back uh, at Port Harcourt. Uh, and uh, I'm glad that Nigeria is leading this important uh, effort. And I'm really happy to be a part of this conversation and to join this uh, esteemed guests and sisters of uh, who are leading the uh, the world of uh, book production and uh, the reading culture in Africa. I'm really, really uh, happy to be with you all. Um, the High Publishers um, was started in 98. Um, I was um, uh, an, uh, an exiled journalist in Los Angeles. Um, I left for a conference and uh, I couldn't return. My three weeks um, uh, visit to Los Angeles turned into uh, a 24 years uh, exile. Uh, it was uh, this time uh, two years ago that I returned to Ethiopia for the first time. Uh, and uh, even though that uh, I was, I couldn't go back to my home country, Ethiopia, uh, I have had uh, the privilege to travel to so many African countries, South Africa, uh, uh, Southern Africa, Western Africa in particular, and uh, of course in East Africa also to Kenya. Uh, so through all this, my engagement and my travels, I was able to 
interact with uh, many people who are in the knowledge uh, production industry. Um, and so to come back to Zahai, I think uh, Zahai was started just to fill a very um, uh, gaping hole that existed in the publishing world in the US. Uh, and um, uh, it was a very, uh, maybe later on we'll come back to, to it, but uh, I was just trying to answer the, the call that many of our writers and scholars were not getting uh, the outlets that they deserve and our stories were not being told. The misinformation that continues about Ethiopia and about Africa in general uh, was something that I couldn't do, just sit down and watch. And um, uh, the reason I started publishing is just to be able to fill that uh, that gap. And um, now we are, uh, uh, we have about uh, five uh, imprints. Uh, and uh, when uh, the Howard University Press closed uh, uh, in 2011, uh, we happen to be the only one standing in universities, uh, especially uh, African-owned and Black-owned and operated. Uh, so it, it has a historical uh, space uh, where it is, where it plays. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it's a very challenging one. Uh, and uh, maybe later on, we will come back to it in detail. Uh, but Zahai, um, we, at Zahai, we were able to publish so many uh, uh, um, very internationally known scholars and emerging scholars, uh, former uh, prime ministers, current prime ministers, and um, many political exiles and descendants. Uh, and uh, we were able to give voices for everyone. I think that's what we, our motto is, that just to be able not only to, to tell a story that we want to hear, but also telling the story. So, since I come from the, uh, the um, pre-press journalist uh, activism, I think I was able to bring that, that it has to play a role to fill the gaps of all the voices in that way that the next generation can be able to uh, address these issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Elias. It's a very uh, important perspective that you bring to the conversation, uh, operating from outside the com uh, continent and starting first in the in the condition of ex exile and re seeing a gap and yeah. wanting to fill that. Thank you. We'll just go to South Africa and Tabiso Malape, who's the publisher of Blackbird Books, and she's going to tell us about her journey. Uh, Tabiso, over to you, please. Thank you. And thank you for having me to uh, to the festival. I think it's just while I was listening to Louise, it feels like I should even be speaking because her experiences and what she's describing mirrors ours so much. So I have been in business now, but Blackbird Books has been in business for five years. And for um, the first four, we were incubated um, uh, under Jacona Media, so it was an imprint of Jacona Media. And so uh, financially, I wasn't really feeling the kind of needing, you know, capital and capital support until this year when I went independent and I realized quite like Louise is saying that books and literature aren't the sexiest thing that people want to invest in. So you, you first have to, if you walk into a room full of investors and you ask them, what have books done for you in your life? You draw blanks um, and just, you know, just speaks to how much you you know the divide is in terms of you know being a publisher and trying to get that kind of funding but also um i think compounded to the continental issues that louise has raised is that south africa is unfortunately a racially charged country and we unfortunately live with them you know what we inherited from um the apartheid regime and what is the apartheid legacy with white privilege and we've got a minority that you know, almost that behaves as though they own and 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 have the sole ownership um, on on the on this industry, as it, as it were. And so, I think while we try to get a reading culture up, um, and while we're trying to make you know strides into this industry, you're also fighting for inclusion. Um, and I think for you know the first time last year, I went to. Um, the International Publishers Association conference that happened in Nairobi. And I think I finally you know, felt like I belonged as a publisher because I was around so many African publishers. And you know, whereas it was quite opposite here, I'd be at an event and I'd be the only black face or one of very few black faces. And when I went to Nairobi last year, I think I finally realized that 
potential that we we have and which made me then shift my focus completely in terms of uh, my publishing whereas when we started um it was solely to give young black south africans a platform um voices that would um ordinarily not have been heard um in the normal publishing industry and after my trip to Nairobi, you know, I, I figured it's not a South African platform. It is an African platform. Um, you know, you can't divorce the two because if I operate as a South African platform, then I operate in, in a place that is very hostile and not very easy to navigate. And if I operate as an African um, entity in an African platform, I've got support and I've got people that look like me, um, that have the same ideas like me, like who want to do the same and achieve the same things that I want to achieve. Um, and, and that is why we started publishing then um, writers that were from outside of um, South Africa. And I, th I think, you know, the distribution thing has been bugging me a lot. And I, I think the one way that I can imagine we can sort it out, and I've tried speaking to a few people about this, and I just think that people have, you know, you know are quite risk covers. And um, so it's going to take time for people to trust each other and to get those collaborations going but if i if we started talking you know more about core publications and how we make our content um readily available in the continent without having i hate that i have to read nigerian literature that must first go to the uk and then come to me um which also means that i am participating and contributing money into an economy that does not do anything for the african economy um, and I think as, as publishers, that is the one thing we need to address um, in the continent and address it together and very urgently. Um, but yeah, I think that's about what I have for now. Uh, I'm seeing, I'm hearing uh, linkages there, definitely linkages about the challenges of being publishing, uh, of publishing on the continent. Um, you were working, Tabiso, you were working with uh, Jakana Media. What yeah. exactly uh, prompted you to start uh, th this journey of starting Blackbird Books five years ago? It was the next best thing to do. So I started at Jakana Media as an intern in 2010 um, and then went on very quickly. So, you know, I went through a phase of uncertainty in terms of not knowing how I would manage to publish the books that were being published because one, I didn't know the people that were publishing and or did I identify with the stories that they were being told. So once I started carving out the, you know, the, the, the market and stories that were meant for people that looked, sounded and felt like me, um, it became easy. And because that was established very quickly, um, it, it, it got to a point where I'd reached my ceiling quite quickly. I, I knew for definite what I wanted to do. And so starting Blackbird was the next best thing uh, because then I could just concentrate on that when I was working under Jakarta Media, it meant at some point I had to publish what my boss wanted me to publish or work on a project that my boss wanted me to work on. So under Blackbird, I had full editorial uh, uh, control. I could, I could curate a platform that looked like what I envisioned and, and you know, bring people on board that I thought could help move um, the country forward in terms of the stories that we were telling. Um, I mean, and, and it's been it's it's been quite a journey because, you know, you five years ago, I'm not the same publisher anymore. You know, five years ago, uh, when I started Blackbird, Excel sheets went to my friend, you know, um, it wasn't things I needed to concern myself about. And now we're at a place where I'm having to be more of an administrator than I am a publisher, which is a weird uh, place to sit on and sometimes very uncomfortable, sometimes very hurtful. Sometimes, you know, you have absolutely no sleep because of it. Mm -hmm. So it, I started to answer your question. Um, I started Blackbird Books because it was the next best thing to do. Thank you. Uh, what you say about mm -hmm. the situation uh, when you started, I remember uh, getting a collection of short stories by South African women in the mid uh, 2000s, and 16 women published in this uh, in this in this anthology, and only one of them was a black writer. And we've moved uh, some distance from that time, so that's all very good. Thank you, thank you so much. If we can go to L Louise and have Louise uh, speak to 
this thing you say, and which I also hear in Elias's um, story about the, the narratives of the country, of Rwanda in your case, Ethiopia in the case of uh, Elias. So uh, Louis, Rwanda in your case, um, at some point up until recently, most of the books were actually written by outside outsiders. Can you can you talk to that and how what was that like and uh, what was the reading culture before you came on board? Mm. Yeah, thanks, uh, Malara. Um, the reading culture is largely still the same. Huh? Um, I wouldn't say that um, there's been a massive change because we've you know sort of come on board or anything. I think that's the sort of thing that takes a long time to to change. Um, and I think that it has it has a lot to do with um, education. It has a lot to do with, um, you know, how um, how people are brought up um, here. And of course, um, you know, it's been years and years of um, creating a system or a sort of structure that doesn't encourage that sort of thing. So it's very difficult for it to change overnight. But I would say that um, there was a sense, I think, when I, you know, wanted to read um, work about Rwanda, you know, whether it was a university, whether it was uh, in different um, contexts, um, growing up as a child, you know, wh when I wanted to have some access to stories about about this country, I remember always struggling quite a lot um, to, you know, find anything that was, um, you know, written by by Rwandans. And it's not just Rwanda. I think that, I mean, in Rwanda, it's, it's sort of, it's quite stark, but of course, um, you know, as a continent, that was something that we, you know, we largely all struggled with. But in the case of Rwanda, um, I remember, I think one one interesting story is, you know, sort of at university um, being given my reading list on a course that was on Rwanda and, um, you know, looking through the whole reading list and not finding a single, um, you know, article or book by a Rwandan author. And I thought a whole course on on Rwanda with, uh, you know, you've got about 50 titles on here and not a single one by a Rwandan, you know, how, how can this be? And it was something that I, you know, that I really struggled with um, for a while. And, um, you know, it was about maybe a year after I'd started Who's the Press and it really brought home why it mattered that, um, that we existed and that the work we're doing, um, we were doing the work that we were doing at the time. Um, and, you know, at the moment, we've got this really interesting title that just came out by Yolande Mukagasana, which is an account of her experience of the genocide. And actually, at the time when Yolande wrote that title, she was the first um, Rwandan um, survivor to actually write uh, about her experience of the genocide uh, in 1994. And, you know, what was interesting about that was that there had been so many uh, books already published on the, um, the genocide against the Tutsi at the time. And it was unbelievable, not a single one by, uh, by a Rwandan. She was the first one. And so you can imagine, you know, how, um, you know, survivors, for example, at the time felt, um, you know, when encountering their stories told through someone else's lens. Um, it, it's quite um, disempowering. And um, and it's the same experience that I had as well, reading uh, about my country through the eyes of um, these, you know, Westerners. Um, really, really disempowering. Thank you. Yes, I, I've read a few narratives of uh, the genocide against the Tutsi in uh, Rwanda myself, and they were all written by by white white people. Um, so we'll go to Elias. And this question of narrative again, of 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 with with regards to Ethiopia, uh, this time, can you please um, address that also? Which I understand was part of what prompted you to start Sehai. That's very true. Uh, I, I I think um, one thing that you can see from this conversation is that our experiences. Uh, uh, however different it may look from our geographical locations where we, we belong or what stories we, we, we focus, uh, the common reality is that we have never uh, controlled our narratives or uh, the stories we tell or the stories told about us. Uh, that goes back to centuries ago when uh, the first uh, printing press uh, started. Uh, the stories that was told since the first uh, printing press started in Europe until 
the decolonization of Africa in the late 50, 1950s. Uh, that's all, almost uh, uh, 450 years plus. Uh, it's about 470 years. Um, uh, and with all that, that those, those moments, the stories, our stories was controlled by e Europeans. The reason is that uh, one, to colonize the continent and take the raw materials. The second is to subjugate our people into slavery to the new world. So what all this did is that uh, they had to control our narrative and through the, the number one, through the publication, the publishing industry. And that was used in the, in the churches and also in the educational uh, industry institutions and in the industries. And with that, we inherited with the new when Africa uh, gained its independence and uh, formed its own uh, um, um, uh, rights to do things. So it's about, but it's a very short time, less than 60 years. In that 60 years, uh, we didn't have c control over our means of production or our um, uh, financing. So what that it has created is the the conditions that we find ourselves. Ethiopia is not different. Uh, uh, it, it, since the 1974 revolution, uh, Ethiopia was Ethiopia belonged in the uh, the, the East and West uh, during the uh, in the socialist camp. That means that Ethiopia was uh, used as a bunching back for the West. Mm -hmm. And the, imagine the brain uh, drain that um, uh, we all endured that took almost every educated uh, Ethiopian that you can imagine to the West. And they were, when they found out themselves in the West, they didn't have access to the publishing industry as much as they want to. So we, are, we have become at the losing end. So all this contributed so much into what has happened, why this is happening, why aren't we mm -hmm. getting the, the, fund, the funding that we don't get, why is the distribution, uh, is this difficult, and why don't, don't we have the skill sets, uh, not only to propagate our story, to write our story, to edit our story, to publish our story, so we don't have the means to do so. And even if we want to do it, we won't be able to do it with the quality. Uh, and we are forced, the very important thing is that we're forced to speak to write, to uh, to be educated in the language that is foreign to us. And all this contributed to the lack of uh, publishing industry. So it's not, um, we don't have to take, inter we, we don't have to internalize everything. I mean, there is a systemic problems around the globe. And then, but how can we fix that? How can we, we, um, we push that into, uh, uh, to make it a better uh, uh, condition into uh, the, the future generations. And I think uh, that's where, where Tahai um, finds its strengths to operate. And um, when we started publishing uh, in the uh, late 1990s, uh, early 2000, it was the time where most publishing companies were closing in, in, Amer in America. And when we uh, took it full time, people went, you know, people thought that I was going crazy because of I abandoned everything and went into this. Uh, and the reason is that the stories that needs to be told, the stories that we need to share, the stories that I know that the world needs to know about my own country and the continent I came from, uh, was much greater than my own personal gain. And that's where the impetus come. That's where the force come uh, came. Uh, and so uh, that's why uh, it's a high is where it is today. And I think we have a long way to go. Uh, uh, and um, this is we're just taking baby steps towards that that liberation of uh, our narratives. Thank you, Ethiopia becoming a punching bag between East and West during the Cold War. I think many African nations can uh, relate to that kind of um, situation, maybe to a lesser or greater degree. Uh, language, um, Tabiso. Uh, can you speak to the question of language? Are there any considerations when you are deciding what to publish? What is your what is your strategy or your take on what language people should uh, publish in? Are you looking to publish in indigenous African languages, or are you already doing so? 
So I, I have not. I have not been publishing in Indigenous languages, and I think um, a large part of it, um, it's, it's, it's multifaceted, but a large part of it is that the, you know, my coming out and my, my, my you know, coming out as a publisher happened within a system that was publishing um, in English and only in English. Um, and also because the reading culture is, is, is very, I mean, it's, it's nothing to write home about. And um, when I started in publishing a decade ago, I remember that the one thing that was said constantly was that black people did not read. Um, and now we've moved to a place where we're saying black people do read if you, you know, if you, if you put them, if you give them the stories that they want to read in. And now we're having increased calls from um, the you know readers and the market itself to say we would love to to read in our own languages. But I, for one, do not trust that the market is ready. Um, I'm not. Um, I think that just by the mere act of publishing in South Africa and in this continent is already like a big risk to take. And I feel like. I'm not going to be the one that takes on that risk yet, you know, um, and, and because we've got a ministry that's got some of the best policies on paper. But, you know, just to give you an example, when when, when the pandemic hit, we had a minister, you know, giving, um, um, you know, going live press press conference to talk about the relief fund um, for, for our industry. And not once, not once from when he began to when he ended, did he mention the word book and or publishing. So it's it's something that the government should be coming to party to. Um, it's not something that should be left to publishers. I feel like publishers have been burdened with the, the job of creating um, not just the material for people to read, but to create and maintain a reading culture to, you know, to up, uphold um, society's cultures. It's just, we, we have so much piled on us that is really ultimately not fair. Um, I would love to go into at some point when it's been established that it can be done. It's 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 a route I would take, um, but I just don't feel ready yet. I don't think I've got the mental capacity to do that. I, you know, every day um, with this job and with this business, you wake up and you know you almost come and bring your mental health as an as an offering. You know, every day this is the one thing that you can bargain with and it's the one thing that you can use as collateral is your mental health and i think at some point i need to love myself and my daughter enough to you know to hold to hold back on it and say you know let someone else carry that torch yes i mean given the mm -hmm. the, the harsh terrain and the very serious challenges asking you a question about ind indigenous language uh, publishing almost seems like a hopeful <laughs> question uh, so if i can then put that to did you want to say something uh, yeah, very yeah. so you know I, I i wanted to say that you know we, we having increased calls from people uh, because we we are you know going through like a, a renewed sense of um you know, you know what it means to be black and what it means to be African, but also we. These are the same people who speak to their children in English and English only. Mm -hmm. um, and 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 so I, I'm sorry, but I'm not finding that you're a reliable market if your child can't speak your native lang language. You know, your child can't go to your village and speak to the people in your village in his own language, but you're asking us as publishers to take on such huge risks. And I mean, it's 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 one of the things is that, you know, growing up in, in South Africa in the 80s and the 90s, white assimilation was, was who we were as black people. You know, everyone wanted to send their children to previously um, white schools. Um, you know, people wanted to move to the suburbs. People wanted to, people wanted to be included in white culture. And what that led to is that we lost our languages. We we lost the, you know, the the, you know, the holding for it, and, and it's not fair to us that publishers be the people that bring it back. So if I can just go to Louise, so does it um, seem like taking baby steps that what publishers can do, publishers such as yourself, Tabiso, especially working on the, and us here in, in, in Nigeria, you know, Wida Books and uh, many others. Is it a case of 
just achieving what is achievable now and then aiming for that long term, taking baby steps. Is, is that is that a practical practical approach? Do you think? And is that how your own experience has been so far? Yeah, I mean, I was listening to Tabisa, and I wanted to um, to clap or snap or you know do different things because that's exactly how I feel um, when it comes to. Um, the weight that's put on our shoulders as publishers, there are these expectations that, you know, we we need to be the ones that are pushing um, the envelope on, say, for example, um, you know, languages, you know, we're the ones who should be taking on the risk around distribution, we're the ones who should be taking on the risks around putting in place the structures and systems that would facilitate this industry. You know, there are very few uh, industries that start um, the way that we've had to, the very few that have to sort of build up from scratch, um, you know, they, for a lot of them, they'll find some of the basics in place. So I think it's 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 a lot to ask um, of publishers to be able to do all these um, different things. So, I mean, there's some, you know, for us at the moment, we're thinking of things as basic as finding, uh, you know, a good printer that is going to, you know, print good quality, um, you know, books. Uh, and that's affordable. And to this day, we're still, you know, going to India to do all our printing. Why? You know, why don't we have something on the continent that's affordable? Why don't we have something in Rwanda that's affordable? So that, you know, there's a lot of um, very basic things that have that are yet to be, you know, properly, um, you know, put in place before we start to actually take on some of the other bigger risks uh, around, you know, language. So, for example, um, we had uh, we we thought about experimenting with 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 language and um, getting a sense of whether actually this was something that was feasible. And we did that. Um, we couldn't do that on our own, of course, because of course our resources are, are quite limited. So what we did was uh, we secured um, a grant to be able to experiment because that's what you do. You know, as a small business, you can experiment with your own resources. So um, you know, the British Council and um, uh, a few other partners that we had worked with us uh, around producing um, what we called Radio Book Rwanda titles. So these were titles that um, were in Kenya, Rwanda um, and English. Uh, and what we did was, um, you know, publish them both in print and uh, and audio. And what we were doing was experimenting with publishing in, in Kenya, Rwanda but then also uh, publishing in both print and audio to get a better sense of what actually sells or works. And we got our answers and the answers are actually, people are just not ready to buy titles, um, you know, at the scale that we need to be able to run a business um, in, in, in Kenya Rwanda. Um, you know, people are not, um, you know, they're not as keen as would imagine um, to get uh, content in audio format here on the continent. And also of course, we're still struggling with distribution. So, you know, like I said, it's, this, this is a lot um, in terms of, um, you know, demands on publishers to be able to take on quite a lot of risks, especially with uh, limited capital and uh, quite a limited uh, size of market. Thank you. To Elias, uh, you've spoken about this thing about the gentrification of mm. stories. Mm. Can you talk to that? Yes, I, I think it, it's a continuation of what I was talking about earlier. Uh, you know, um, Africa is, uh, as a nation, as, as state uh, nations, uh, is young in a way, uh, but our story is, is as ancient as it gets. Uh, and in the current uh, 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 Politically or technological aspect of it, uh, that our stories are being delegated to the sides, and we don't find it anywhere. And for example, um, publishing. When we talk about publishing, actually, um, uh, I'm talking about knowledge production. You know, um, it may appear in a book form, it may appear in an audio form, it may appear in film or other means. But the creation of knowledge, the creation of stories. The process where the, the 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 person writes it, and it gets edited and processed and comes out in a book format. And as as Tabiso and um, Louisa uh, mentioned, um, we don't have a proper printing mechanism, you know, in the continent, uh, in most of the places. South Africa a little bit different. 
uh, uh, I mean, from literally uh, all over all, all, every country in the continent, South Africa is in, in a much, much better condition. Even there, the editorial system is controlled by uh, the white mi minority. Um, there was a study done in 2002, I believe, uh, and uh, the study came out with a report that 1.5% of world knowledge production was created. Uh, in the continent, only 1.5. And within that 1.5 uh, percentile, 65% uh, comes from South Africa. Uh, and uh, it says that 35% uh, comes from North Africa. And where is the the other sub, sub, um, uh, sub-Saharan African countries uh, lie on this equation, this number? Uh, it's almost non-existent. Uh, and so that's the form of, uh, you know, gentrification of our stories. If we can produce the book, if we can produce the, if we can curate and publish the book, then our stories are going to be uh, relegated somewhere else. And who writes the Rwandan stories is not the Rwandese, but just the people who are outside of uh, Rwanda or the people who come to visit or work for a few years and they own our stories, as we have seen. It has happened I'm in intrigued. many countries. I'm intrigued by what you've been able to achieve with Sehai. Over 200 titles, five imprints, you say. Yes. And uh, when you were starting out, what kind of um, mindset did you need to have in order to get that off the ground? Because it sounds um, mind boggling, especially working from. Mm. Uh, an immediate terrain that was outside of the continent and uh, and and also within the experience of exile. Yes, yeah, I mean, you have to be crazy. Truly, you have to be mad to do what I did. And And when I think about it, if I don't love my country, if I don't love my people, if I don't know the stories that I know growing up in Ethiopia, I would not have dared to do this. And I would have stopped and walked away from it um, when things got, got tough on me. Uh, because things got tough. It was very, very difficult. But I, I, I hung on. Uh, and uh, I published my first book. I was so discouraged. And I stopped publishing for four years uh, because mm -hmm. I thought that it was just a lost case. But in that four years, I also learned that without that relationship I had with many of the exiled uh, scholars and political uh, dissidents, uh, if I don't get their stories out, they won't, I, I don't know anyone who had that kind of relationship with these people. If I don't publish those stories, those stories won't be, won't, won't get uh, to be published. So that's what gave me the, the impetus to, to, to go ahead and publish. Uh, imagine I published uh, the former um, uh, president of Ethiopia, the current prime minister of Ethiopia, and I have published so many political leaders in between, and also many of the scholars and people that I uh, that um, that I didn't even have uh, uh, a chance to meet uh, prior to that. And if I didn't publish the way I did, if I didn't help them and work with them, uh, I'm talking about the, the early part of it. Their story would not have uh, seen. Um, uh, 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 gotten out in a way that it is. So, so, so we have to we have to go into it. I, if, if you, I mean, there were many other African publishers who came and left the scene in the past twenty years uh, in America. Uh, there are many people who started with uh, big fanfare. They had big uh, um, uh, launch programs for one book. They spent so much money to launch that book just to, to say that just I am here. Then I spent. 10 years amount of money in, in, in the books that I published. Uh, you know, I published one book a year or two books a year. Now we published about uh, 20 books a year now. Uh, that's where we are. And we just opened an office in Ethiopia. Uh, and uh, uh, if you, <laughs> thank you. And if you that's live great. longer, you will see that. that uh, and we just opened our first book bookstore in Ethiopia. And out of all places, at the National Palace, where the, the new prime minister started a, a park. That tells you the importance of publishing. That tells you where the government is thinking the stories, uh, the narrative, the narrative is important. And when you think the problems that exist in Ethiopia, when you see it truly, uh, as Molara, you said earlier, that it's not an Ethiopian problem, it's an African problem. It's a systematic problem. It's not an accident. It's actually purposely done. 
And so that's where you have to come and say, okay, we have to change this. But you can't change it as an Ethiopian or as a Rwandese or as, uh, as, a, as a South African or a Nigerian. You have to come together, find a way to collaborate and w work it out. Uh, and so, for example, just uh, just to give you an example, uh, this is a story that I have been talking. I used to talk with uh, my friend uh, Chris Abani uh, a, a long time ago, uh, because uh, he was here when when I started the press. One of the things we were, we were plotting was that when we do future public stories, that to act to add uh, the, the 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 personalities in the stories to make them uh, the actors to make them a Nigerian and Ethiopian and a Kenyan. So that means that you have three countries as a market, than one country as a market. So that I think we ha that's the next step that we have to work with our uh, uh, authors because you have to expand your market. If you do, if you always see the, your market as as um, America or Europe, then that's where the loss comes. That's where the the clutch happens, and that you're where you're going to be hold, held down. But you have it. I mean, the technology is going to change. The printing is going to be improved. The distribution we have to improve them, and it's going to be improved. But while all those mechanisms are being going to be in place, what we need to come is that since there is a political will from the top, the, there is an African Union, there should be an, a, a bottom da, a bottom up approach that uh, we control, which we have to call to communicate, especially conferences like this, what it what it brings is that it gives us a chance to talk to those who create knowledge. So that means that, for example, in your, when you create your next book, just pick the, the biggest three country, countries in the continent, Niger, Nigeria, uh, Egypt, Ethiopia. Then if you add three people in the, in the book, and if you make them play it well, imagine you doubled and quadrupled your, your, your market. And I think we have to be able to do those kind of things. Yeah. Great idea, uh, uh, but if you pick, yeah. if you pick uh, the three biggest countries in Africa, I don't know what uh, people in Rwanda will think about that if you do that <laughs> all the time. But what you've done, Elias, is you've actually led me uh, very nicely to what would be my next question. And I think maybe we'll go to Tabiso first uh, to know what kind of links you're building across the continent with other publishers in order to surmount some of these challenges that um, are facing publishing in on the continent today sure i mean look it's 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 not easy like i said when i first when we first started that i have you know reached out to a few people um i didn't know about louise until a few weeks ago which makes me feel very ashamed but I mean, you know, just think, looking at our stories, I think there's great synergy between us that, you know, that we, we could be able to leverage on. I've been talking to someone in Kenya. I've been talking to someone in Ghana um, and, and, you know, just trying to see, you know, if we were to co-pub on one title. And, you know, I had this conversation with you, Malora, um, um, a few months ago about the idea of co-publishing. And I think I'm just so hugely encouraged uh, by um, Elias and, and what he's saying, because, you know, when you sit in your office by yourself, you, you, you imagine you're starting to go a little crazy and to hear him articulate so well what I've been thinking about um, the past few months, you know, gives me courage. There's a presentation that I ought to have started working on about a few days ago, but because I felt like I was being crazy and because I felt like what I, what I, what I was thinking about is not possible, um, I, I just kind of been stuck. And this kind of gives me the the, the kind of energy I need to, to, to go on with that. I definitely, you know, think also that um, with what Elias is saying, and I've been saying this for a while, that South Africa has on the, on the continent some of the most sophisticated, um, you know, channels and in, in, in the ecosystem of publishing, and that if if any one country, um, you know, ought to have started some kind of way for for us to start talking to each other, that it ought to have been South Africa. But because the publishing here is so wide, that if if they go to 
Frankfurt and they go to the London Book Fair, then they have done what they have need to do for their market, you know, and for their authors. But we need to, and I mean, I loved being at Frank Frankfurt. I, I'll go again. Um, and, I, you know, I want to go to London Book Fair, but I want to go because it's fun. And I want to go because it's a beautiful, you know, um, energy of people around the world in publishing. But it shouldn't be that we as African people go there to beg. Um, that we beg for our books to be looked at, we beg for our books and our authors to be considered, we should go to share, you know, we we should go to, to showcase what we have, and not to be begging to be assimilated or to be let in. Um, and, and that's only going to happen if we do um, come together as a market here, as, as you know, as publishers. First, um, we need to, and it's, I mean, Speaking as a woman who's a publisher, we can't ignore also the fact that, you know, Africa is probably one of the, mo the most patriarchal um, places in the world. So it's it's not easy that the associations are mostly men. Um, and, and so we, we almost need like a parallel thing for women. And it's been very encouraging to, you know, to come into this um, in a time when, you know, the International Publishing Association has a VP like um, Bordeaux who works tirelessly to make sure that women are constantly creating networks for them to tap into each other. You know, I'm very lucky that I came into this at a time when someone like Bibi Bagara Yusuf has been doing this for so long and she's able to send you a message and say, hi, it looks like you're not coping. How can I help? What do you need? Um, so I think we are in the, you know, we are going in the right direction, but is it is it quick enough it's it's never going to be it's probably going always going to be like baby steps and i'm probably not going to retire by 50 like i'd hoped <laughs> you had hoped uh, but you <laughs> but it's interesting also that a lot of the publishers uh, making uh, new tracks on the continent now are women and it's something that we can look at and address uh, later but um louise um, I'd just like to also hear from you what kind of um, uh, partnerships you're building across the continent. Yeah, um, I mean, for us, partnership has always been, um, you know, the reason why we thought we could actually operate. Um, and we had quite a lot of um, support from different people, whether it was actually, you know, BB like uh, Tabiso mentioned, or whether it was, um, you know, people like uh, Lola and Yu Molara that we've um, we've been engaging with uh, on, on Oda and uh, One Reads, uh, whether it's... Um, uh, you know, at the time, Kwani in in South in, in Kenya, sorry, that we partnered with on different projects. Um, so we've tried to really engage um, with uh, different publishers across the continent because we understood very early on that uh, we were too small, um, you know, to make a massive impact, and we needed to work. Um, with others, uh, I also needed, uh, like Tabisa mentioned, you know, the moral support um, to keep going. Um, it's uh, it's not an easy industry to operate in, and I have contemplated exiting quite a number of times and uh, been driven, of course, by what Elias was saying around, uh, you know, knowing that it's much bigger than you as an individual, and what you're doing um, is not necessarily just for yourself, but for future generations. So, you know, that has been my driving force. And, you know, listening to people like Elias, uh, you know, talking through their experiences and how they've um, managed to, you know, push through and produce such uh, huge amounts <laughs> of titles and uh, content uh, over time. I think that is, you know, the sort of encouragement that we need. Um, and I hope that, you know, we'll have different forums or platforms where we can continue to engage with each other and encourage each other um, to sort of fight on and move on. Um, there's a lot of publishers that started, um, you know, around the same time that we did. And, you know, we've seen a lot of people exit um, the industry and it's very sad to see that. Um, but I think it just stems from the fact that it's a complex place to operate in. And when you don't have the support um, of other um, you know, publishers in the space who share your experience and understand the complexities, then it's very difficult for you to, um, you know, to keep um, sight of why you're actually doing it in the first place. I also think that collaboration is the only way that we can actually um, you know, manage or address the issue of distribution. 
I think that's, you know, Tabisa said it quite a few times around the core public, around core publication. You know, we attempted to do this with very many um, publishers across the continent um, when we were starting out. But I remember it, it was just, you know, the, there was not the same sort of spirit of wanting to, to do that at the time. But I'm hoping that, uh, you know, now we'll see some movement around that and, you know, some real um, commitment to trying to address these challenges. But otherwise, um, yeah, for us, collaboration um, has always been at the heart of what we do. Collaboration, sharing ideas, thinking together, great. Uh, to Elias, yes. what um, ideas can publishers explore uh, to better market their books on the, on the continent? And also whatever you want to share on you know, widening the distribution channels mm -hmm. and surmounting some of these uh, problems that bedevil pu publishing in Africa. Uh, thank you. Uh, before before I answer that, let me uh, try to talk to uh, Luis. Uh, uh, as Luis would, would know that there's a lot of stories, uh, connection in history with Rwanda since it's very close to Ethiopia. And uh, so I didn't forget the smaller countries. So, you know. <laughs> I, I was being with you at your I know, exactly. I know, I know. <laughs> I know. Um, I, I, I think, you know, um, uh, one of the things that I did um, in the early part of uh, uh, Tsahai is that uh, collaboration and partnerships. And uh, one of the places that I started my first earlier collaboration was uh, South Africa. And I have come, I have traveled to South Africa several times and uh, co published with UNISA Press. Uh, and um, uh, in every meeting that I had with uh, UNISA Press, I, I worked with incredible individuals uh, at the press who really wanted to uh, uh, to work with us and uh, to expand uh, their content internationally. Uh, and um, uh, But in every meeting that I had, one of the things that I remember is that, especially the staff, uh, I didn't see uh, uh, South African blacks in the meetings. I'm always dealing with the the whites. And um, whenever I can, I ask um, uh, if there, there there were black people working there, but I asked them to join the meeting uh, and uh, so that we can have that diversity of uh, at least, uh, you know, um, identity. Uh, that's what I was trying to say earlier, that Africa is young in this world in, in, in a way of knowledge production. And we have been, uh, 60 years is not a lot. Uh, when we think about when we think of ourselves we see it in in the long years of historical uh, legacies we have as a continent but we don't see it as a free people as a as decolonized country even decolonized came with another form of colonization that we don't even have names for it to go to uh, tabiso perhaps um, I'm very very um, and I'm sure you all are about rights, rights to our stories. When you want to sign an author, what are some of the trends that you've observed, either with the publishers uh, internationally that you're dealing with? Um, a lot of our authors now are signing uh, straight internationally with agents and publishers. And then, I mean, Tabiso said it earlier about a Nigerian uh, author having gone to Europe before even coming to her to f for, 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 for her input. So what, what are some of the uh, trends that you've observed and what can we do about this? I'll, I'll come to Louise also, but I think we'll let um, Tabiso take this first. It's a very tricky one. So for example, with us here, I mean, you, you don't find that South Africa is, we're not, we're not buying, as many rights into the country as we are trying to sell out. So even in the 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 kind of um, the the us getting content from like um, the West, um, it's it's through a distribution deal. So one publishing house here will distribute for Harper, uh, and, you know, all of that. And I find that because when we publish, so our front list, for example, if you're doing a run for front list and you're doing fiction, you, 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 you're printing about a thousand to a thousand five to start off with. 
and in that the it the pie just isn't big enough to accommodate um agents yet and so i find that the african writers that sign to um agents first and then try come to us to get published it's just always such a mission because you've signed with this agent that is sitting in in la who's used to working with figures that we can't we can't even dream of yet so i always say to people if you're coming to me with an agent just try try another company try a bigger publishing house because i'm not about to do bidding wars i don't have money and i actually have people here who are waiting for me you know to to say yes to their stories and to say yes to their books so it's a very tricky one um rights for us i mean when i sign i sign publishers uh, writers on directly and and because of the size of our market you do want to help them you know launch their careers internationally because that's the one thing that's actually going to give them a little bit of money um you can't um you, you know you can't live as a writer in south africa currently so it is a bit of a you know it's 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 a for me it's a weird place to sit at again because you know you want to sell rights out but you can't buy rights in so it's 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 a bit tricky for me and i do i, I would love to work with agents you know because then you'd have someone who is taking care of like mood swings uh that come with writers and you know kind of those emails in the middle of the night that say, I can't believe you haven't asked me how I am today. So I'd love to, to, to work with agents, but we just don't have a market that's big enough for us here to, like the pie isn't big enough to accommodate um, someone living here and, uh, you know, making a living as, as, as an agent. Okay, thank you. Louise, what's your experience with agents uh, negotiating for book rights What's your experience? Mm -hmm. uh, is there a sense sometimes of being held to ransom by someone far away that doesn't know the terrain and may not even be as familiar with the story as you are? What, mm -hmm. what, what, what's your take on this? And what should we be striving to achieve? How can we have some kind of critical mass that will give us, give us leverage in these uh, discussions? Yeah, so maybe I've been, um, we've been lucky or maybe we're, you know, too small um, to have dealt with any agents. I haven't actually um, had to to deal with agents just yet. Um, a lot of, um, you know, the, a lot of the um, contracts we've signed were directly with the authors and they didn't sort of reach out to, um, to, um, Agents, I think it's largely because, of course, the market here is quite small. There's not a lot of writers, etc. So we haven't had to deal with that um, as yet. Um, so maybe when something like this happens, this is when I would actually be able to reach out with some of the uh, the publishers here who have had to deal with this um, and try and sort of engage uh, them on how best to to, to deal with that um, issue. But no, we've we've not had to. In Nigeria, as you know, we're in a huge ocean of writers and books and rights and uh, uh, international publishers and agents and all of that. So we have a bit of a different um, experience. If mm. I can go to um, Elias and ask Elias, you've opened uh, up in, uh, in Ethiopia now. How is that going? And when you first started at uh, uh, Sehai, what was the reaction in in your country and how is it now? I mean, you've published a prime minister, so you've come a long way. So if you can uh, give give us some insight around all of that. Uh, Ethiopia, I think for the past, uh, uh, since the 1974 revolution, Ethiopia uh, has been ruled by uh, a dictatorship. And so that means that the dictators uh, want to control the narrative uh, to their own advantage. Uh, and because of it, they also stifled the, the publishing industry. So the publishing industry didn't grow. Uh, there were publishing houses uh, growing up uh, that uh, the, the communist government established. Uh, and uh, it served us, uh, but at the same time, it was uh, under um, censorship. So there was uh, oppositions or alternative uh, uh, stories were not told through it. Uh, and it was tightly controlled by the system. And the, the government that came after it in 91 
uh, that I uh, I started as a as a journalist as a young journalist also continued the same tradition even though they claimed that democracy would be uh, 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 practiced uh, and uh, for the first time this is the uh, two years ago that the new uh, prime minister came to office and he's trying to change that system but one thing that you have to understand is that this is a stratified system that it takes time to uh, to change uh, so uh, there is major problems in taxation for example that we see now uh, book taxation and uh, printing quality and machinery uh, ethiopia imports the um, all aspect of the uh, um, uh, uh, the materials to to, to print the book. That means that books are very expensive than it should be. Uh, sometimes it's better to, uh, to print it outside the country than inside. Uh, and the quality of uh, printing is really uh, lower. And, but it's, it's, it's getting, in some aspects, it's getting better, but still the problem is there. So we have a long way to go. Um, if a change has to come, it cannot be revolutionary. It cannot be that we can't throw everything out and start from scratch. It has to be that we have to train the, the, the younger uh, uh, generation to edit better, to write better, to print better, to distribute better. So it's just an ecosystem has to change. The entire ecosystem needs to change. For that entire ecosystem to change, uh, those of us who have been working in that industry for a long time needs to come back and you know help that education process and we have to bring our relationships our partners our uh, uh um, collaborators into this field so that we can be able to change so it's a long-term process it's not going to be a quick fix solution uh, and while while i'm at this point one thing that we definitely need to do is that uh, that we need to start in the especially in this publishing industry we need to start collaborating within the continent for example, that you can bring uh, 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 writing coaches or editor coaches from Nigeria, uh, printers from South Africa. Uh, you know, by utilizing the resources we have within the continent, I think we can we can get it better. One of the projects that I is working with the American University Press Association here in America is that we are trying to create a, a, a center of excellence, publishing excellence. Uh, and we have started this project a while back, but now we are cementing it. And then in the next future, in the next near future, uh, in the near future, we are planning to do a certificate program or some kind of a training program where um, uh, industry professionals would come and uh, uh, train future generation, future leaders in the industry. Now that you've set up back home, um, the, the 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 submissions that you're getting. For mm -hmm. the high, is there a change? Yes, is there a change. <laughs> is there a different color to them, and does that also change or, or in a, in a way alter your orientation as the publisher, in terms of what you want to publish and what you want to focus on? Yeah, yeah, uh, yes. Um, even while we while we are in in uh, in the U.S., we have always published uh, Ethiopian languages, especially Amharic, the national language. Uh, and one thing that we're starting to do now is that we're planning to add um, a push in uh, other languages, Ethiopian languages. And uh, we're uh, in the process of working Tigrinya uh, uh, manuscripts and some uh, Oromifa manuscript. And so with this kind of opening up, um, uh, and there was um, another thing that uh, I think uh, Luz or, uh, or uh, talked about earlier is the uh, the investment, the lack of investment. Uh, and uh, so we're working on that aspect so that we can be able to, um, uh, one publishing company and one uh, institution cannot be able to answer um, uh, the quest for 110 million population. Uh, we need to expand our resources so that we can be able to be effective to do, the, to do so. And so uh, with that, I think, um, we can address this, but in the meantime, one thing that we have seen is that since we uh, we, we open shop in Ethiopia, the number of submissions have increased. Uh, those who didn't know it's a high before are, are are familiar with it now, 
uh, and those who knew Sahai before are very happy to be able to connect with us physically uh, so that they can be able to uh, ask their questions and be able to participate in this process. So hopefully we'll be reading a lot more uh, creative writing, even from, from Ethiopia. Definitely. Uh, on to Luis now. Uh, what kind of, because you, you've been noted for actually working very hard to build uh, a readership. And can you talk about some of that, some of the initiatives that you've, uh, that you've introduced in order mm -hmm. to get new writing coming forth in Rwanda? Yeah, so we, I mean, I mentioned earlier and that we had, had actually a fiction prize. You yeah. published uh, some some titles, or you are about to publish some titles from 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 workshops. Yes, that's yeah. what I mean. You, yeah, exactly. Yes. No, I mentioned before that we had to actually build a lot of it from scratch. So, including, um, you know, trying to. Um, you know, get the content to the level that we wanted it to to be at, you know, or whether it was encouraging people to actually start producing content. So we run uh, a prize for fiction um, for a few years. And actually, some of our first titles were from that. Um, and part of that also was um, a, ment a sort of mentorship um, for Rwandan authors who had actually never quite uh, engaged with the uh, broader um, African um, uh, community of writers and so what we did was identify uh, African writers that were already publishing and already doing quite well so we established African writers to mentor um, these what we called emerging um, Rwandan authors um, and that actually went went quite well and uh, you know we had a, some really good um, support from people like um, Jennifer Nansu Gamakumbi we had some support from people like Taya Silasi we had support from um, but quite a lot of uh, of authors across the continent. Everyone was keen um, to help us get to a place whereby we were able to actually um, get some really good writing out of Rwanda. And I felt um, the support of the African um, uh, writing community during those moments. Um, what we've also done after that was actually run uh, a number of workshops. And uh, we brought in quite a lot of uh, writers as well. So people like Richard Ali from Nigeria, um, we've brought in um, writers from, from Kenya with the Gelada um, team and, uh, and try to, again, you know, sort of build that capacity around, you know, what does it mean to actually write a good story? Because that's not something that's taught um, in schools here in Rwanda. So, you know, that's just that basic, um, you know, idea of what is the structure of a good story look like? Um, and, um, you know, what does a good writing look like, etc. So we got, we had to do quite a lot of that as well. And then um, we worked with existing initiatives such as the um, the work that um, Ella was doing, Ella Wakatam Ofri doing around uh, with um, like, uh, a team in Uganda around uh, building capacity around public uh, editing. And so we sent quite a number of Rwandans to participate. I think we were the first ones to send Rwandans to participate uh, in those editorial workshops. Um, and uh, I think that was with the African Writers Trust, which was very useful. Um, and then uh, we did quite a lot of um, work as well with the Kane Prize. Um, so we sent Rwandans to participate in the first, um, for the first time in the workshop, the Kane Prize workshop. Um, and then had the Kane Price team come and run their workshop in Rwanda as well, uh, in Gisenyi, and that was in 2017. And from that, we also got quite a lot of interesting stories coming out um, of Rwanda, which was very useful. Um, and so there's been quite a lot um, in terms of, you know, trying to think through what are the sort of different gaps and how can we fill them? Uh, you know, what are some of the initiatives that we can do? And of course, workshops and some of these capacity building initiatives have been um, at the forefront of that. We don't run the prize anymore. Um, there's a lot of other prizes, uh, of course, for African writing. And what we've done is actually try and s send more Rwandan stories to those existing um, prizes. Um, because of course, it's it just, we were taking on too much at the time to try and do all these different initiatives, but also building existing initiatives is something that we're quite passionate about. Um, yeah, thanks. Yeah, okay. Um, Tabiso, you're the first black woman to have your own imprint in South Africa. Um, 
what's that been like and where do you see Blackbird books in the next five years? Yeah, the, the, the first black thing is, um, I mean, it's quite, it's quite tricky because there were other, I feel like it's erased. It was when I was younger and, and quite naive, I, I kind of went with it. But now I realize that it's probably erasing the work. And I found out about other women who have tried to, to, to this publishing thing before. And the only problem and the only reason why they probably went um, seen as much as I was because I had this hyper visibility, but it was because I was attached to a bigger house. Um, so I was cushioned. Um, and I remember I used to get slated for it. Actually, a lot of people didn't want to take me seriously because I was too attached to whiteness or, um, you know, I had too much, I had close to my, I had too close a proximity to whiteness. And so I wasn't to be taken seriously and, and, you know, that, so, I, I think that, like Elias is saying now, that you know the work we do and where we want to go can't be revolutionary. We can't throw things away. If I'm in South Africa and this thing has been owned by whiteness for you know for decades and decades, the best place to start is within that whiteness. You know, you you learn everything you can and you you take from it what you what you can, and then you adapt it for what you want it to be. And I think I've been very lucky in that regard. Um, I, I have, you know, had the opportunity to learn and make mistakes when the mistakes went my own money. Um, and now, um, you know, being independent when one of my team members <laughs> says, oh, I've made a mistake. And I say, how much is, how much is it costing me? It's always the first thing I ask is how much is your mistake costing me? And they say, no, Scott. And I'm like, okay, then, I mean, tell me about it. What are you saying? <laughs> you know, I just <laughs> Five years, because we were we're trying to round up now. Where do you see yourself in five years, very briefly? I hope I hope to be around. Firstly, you know, and 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 thank you, Elias, for for sharing your story tonight because I I feel quite encouraged. Um, I just want to be around. I think you know, just without no frills, no, I have no deep or no profound thing to say. I just <laughs> hope to be around. Great. Elias, where do you see the role of platforms such as the Ake Arts and Book Festival in what you and other publishers are trying to do on the continent in terms of African stories? I think uh, Ake is our Frankfurt Book Fair for the continent. Uh, mm -hmm. This is our London uh, Book Fair for us. Uh, this is how it started. Uh, Frankfurt or London is special because they know the value of stories. And as, a, as any merchandise uh, uh, exchange or uh, market center, publishing is the central gravity. It has that, that the gravitational force is in Europe. And for Africa, I think uh, I was privileged enough to be a guest of uh, uh, our stint uh, uh, Nobel laureate Wale Sharinka. I was a guest, uh, his guest, to, uh, when I came um, to uh, Port Harcourt. Uh, and uh, Nigeria oh, is. Right. Yes, <laughs> exactly. We met. Yes, and and uh, Nigeria is our pride in this sense. In this sense, uh, and uh, if I, if we don't if we don't say it enough, if we don't say it enough, uh, it's our fault. But we really want to thank you. I wanted to use this opportunity to thank you for leading the continent in the literary world. Uh, and we have to do a lot to connect with you in a deeper level, in the partnership level. Uh, there is a lot that we learned from you, and there is a lot for you to learn from us also. Uh, because if you don't understand and if you don't study Ethiopian history, then you are, you'll, you'll miss a lot. Uh, because Ethiopia is not a, a knowledge-consuming society. Ethiopia has always been a knowledge producing publishing center. If you go to any place in the world, in universities in Oxford or Princeton or Howard University, you will find thousands of manuscripts, Ethiopian manuscripts. You know, Ethiopian philosophers published his philo philosophical hatata, um, uh, he calls it, before Descartes was born. But Descartes is known for what Ethiopians was written. 
and and so there is a lot that we can be able to impart in that way and there's those stories need to be translated and published in nigeria nigerians need to access that and africa needs to access that yeah. with that kind of knowledge we can be able to say that we are africans and we're proud of it otherwise mm-hmm. what happens is that what continues to happen is like like hegel did uh, and like sarkozy continued to say that that other people will come and tell us. I'm worried that we we have just about two minutes or so yeah. left. So let me quickly take um, Luis's uh, contribution. Luis, how has the coronavirus uh, pandemic uh, have impacted what you do in the publishing industry in Rwanda, and what lessons have you drawn from it in just in just a minute or two? Because we we, we really have to finish now. Yeah, um, I mean, like uh, I think Tabisa mentioned some of this um, earlier, um, as the publishing industry, we've actually struggled quite a lot, uh, particularly because, of course, with um, with the pandemic, where people, where you know, economies are crashing, etc. The first thing to go is, um, you know, the creative industries, the creative sector. Those are the first ones to struggle, and so even where we've seen um, cases where governments have stepped in to support uh, businesses, um, the creative industry has not been at the forefront front at all it's been whether you know agriculture some of the other core industries so as uh, publishers we've not uh, we've not got you know any support uh, people have you know sort of cut back on uh, expenditure on things like books etc and of course some of the other things that you know that were quite key to us being able to get our, our books out there and our work out there which is of course events um, activities around books those of course are not in, you know going on anymore so that's really just shut down um, you know, a lot of what we are able to do. So I think we've struggled quite a lot, actually, as an industry. And we're already struggling before this. So this makes it a bit uh, more complex. Uh, so we might have to resort to, you know, supporting each other and comforting each other through these tough times. And yeah. hopefully what we can do is explore ways that we can actually create some sort of cushion or support for ourselves as an industry, um, seeing that there's not a lot, there's no one else thinking of us. So we need to try and think of ourselves a bit more. I think it's what I've learned from this. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. I think that's a fine note on which to end this. Uh, thank you very much, Luis Umutoni, Huza Press in Rwanda. Thank you, Tabiso Malape, uh, Blackbird Books, South Africa, and Elias Wondewu, uh, Ethiopia, and the US. Thank you so much. It's been my pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you so you. much. We don't just think of ourselves as a bank. Uh, we think of ourselves as corporate citizens with responsibility for growing the economy. Reading and education is a key part of it. But equally important is having access to reading materials uh, at home. A lot of the intervention we've done throughout this COVID is to ensure that people can safely navigate the uncertainties of the COVID crisis and come out of it ready for, you know, to leave again. Let's take a ride to the past in the back of a phoenix. Let's flow around the moon. The dreams that we have are limited by what we have directly interacted with. What reading does is it makes it possible for you to begin to live in worlds that don't yet exist. One read creates a discipline of reading. One read puts me on a timeline, it gives me an important book and I have an opportunity to read it and to collaborate. It's almost like having someone who does your book selection for you. If you have editors and people who are really good at this saying to you, this is the book for the month, I, I value that. I want to be able to read in a community. I want reading to be a collaborative thing. I want reading to be a communion. And one read allows me to do that. I will use one read any day, anytime. Thank you.